promises a lot and delivers very little. You have to believe. Faith is not necessary to experience what psychedelics have to teach. You don't have to believe. You can be as skeptical as you want. Famous ethnologist Mersiliade called it the archaic techniques of ecstasy, and it's and it certainly is archaic in, in the sense that it's probably our oldest religion, but it's much more than a religion. It's actually a set of practices for achieving altered states of consciousness, whether with the use of drugs or the use of other kinds of techniques like ecstatic drumming and. Uh, you know, sometimes self-flagellation or sometimes, you know, different types of, you know, physical stress. But the basic idea of shamanism is to achieve an altered state of consciousness and not simply to have the experience. The shaman actually uses the altered state to access a transpersonal realm, a realm of spirits or supernatural forces. Uh, which are can maybe allies of some kind, which he or she can manipulate, communicate with, obtain information from uh, to help their the community or an individual. Shamans are medicine men, I guess, in, in Western parlance, and they uh, so shamanism is the is what shamans do. They beat drums, they take drugs, they dance, and they uh, try to cure, they cure people or they attempt to cure people. They interpret dreams, they find lost objects. It harkens back to a time when things like psychotherapy and medicine and uh, magic and religion and all of these things weren't even, you know, fully formed con so the shaman kind of combines all of these roles of he's a priest or a, and, a, and a doctor and a psychotherapist and also uh, often a poet and a, a, an artist and someone that gives expression to the cultural, uh, you know, myth of the culture. So he's a, and I keep saying he, and that's... It, it should be clear there are shamanesses as well, or shaman, w women shaman. It's not a gender-specific kind of thing. Uh, but but the figure of the shaman is a you know uh, important spiritual figure in these non-traditional society, in these traditional societies, in these indigenous societies, uh, respected and a little bit feared. You know, because the shaman is the odd person. The shaman is the person who is in direct contact with the transpersonal and is kind of the interface for the culture. Uh, 
and the rest of the people. He or she is the person that gets to actually dialogue and travel in these realms. And they often use psychotropic plants to do this, not invariably, but quite often. It, it's quite clear that uh, different kinds of hallucinogenic plants and substances were used, including from the bufo toad. Peter first did some examination of this among the Olmec people. So this is before the classic Maya civilization, back around 1200 BC. And the bufo toad can be uh, the, the uh, kind of a 5-MeO-DMT can be extracted from the, uh, the, sh the, the glands on the shoulder of the toad. You know, there's another compound out there called bufotinine, um, which was first discovered in frog skin, actually. Um, and it's, it's got some kind of psychoactivity. Um, it's a little hard to really pin that down. Um, but it's a naturally occurring, you know, tryptamine as well, though. It's found in blood and uh, brain and cerebrospinal fluid and urine, um, any body fluid in animals in which it's been looked for. So they were clearly using uh, psilocybin mushrooms. They were clearly using the 5-MeO-DMT extracted from the bufo toad and possibly a, a more close analog of, of DMT itself. I mean, there's some discussion around the difference between 5-MeO-DMT and uh, regular DMT, but uh, actually modern um, explorers uh, with these substances have reported that there, there are qualitatively different experiences, but both can be uh, pretty soul-shaking. So I think within this context, then, you had a whole array of other uh, hallucinogenic uh, plants being used, the morning glory. The Mazatec Indians today, when Gordon Wasson visited the Mazatec and Miche regions of Oaxaca in the 1950s, it started this whole revolution in understanding the scope and the depth of the of the sacred plants that were being used. So you have uh, Salvia divinorum, for example, is a plant that was used by the uh, the, the uh, Mazatec Indians and is still used today. That's also where the uh, the sacred mushroom cult, the psilocybin mushroom cult, was uh, rediscovered, a place where the sacred mushroom cult apparently survived up until modern times. Part of the fear that society at large has of psychedelic drugs is that the only framework that we have to process these experiences through in Western culture is that of competitive drinking. Competitive drinking is sort of the standard that we use to measure what it's like to alter consciousness. And I think the shamanistic perspective or shamanistic worldview can give us a new perspective on how to process these experiences and show how valuable that they can be. The shamanic perspective essentially would say that drugs are not the ideal way to alter your consciousness and you shouldn't alter your consciousness with any of these types of substances until you at least first master altering your consciousness through other means such as the use of drums, dancing, paying attention to your dreams. There's all sorts of different ways of attaining altered states um, through plants and drugs, through um, trance, meditation, hypnosis, drumming, starvation, fasting, uh, um, exhaustive exercise, all kinds of things. Um, yeah, and in terms of an entheogen, what I would define as an entheogen, um, I'm not fond of the term. Um, because it kind of requires that you have a belief in Theos, which is God or divinity. I think that the term psychedelic is just a bit more descriptive of what these drugs or plants, uh, you know, do or, or what they manifest. You know, psychedelic means, you know, mind manifesting, mind manifesting. And, you know, one could argue that the phenomena one encounters on a psychedelic drug experience are either internally generated or are externally independent and freestanding. Um, I think it still kind of dispenses with uh, theological problems that are accompanied by calling a drug something that 
generates, you know, divinity within, if you don't believe in divinity. It means God within, generating God within, and inside theos, uh, God and gen, gen, generate, so that which generates God inside a person. So, and, and it's a class of drugs, uh, formerly called psychedelic, but it's a way of sort of softening the, the um, bad press of the word psychedelic. And, and, and especially it's to separate it from sort of the party aspect of, of uh, taking a drug and going crazy or, uh, and showing that they, these drugs have a spiritual side to them, if you can find it. A term that I prefer is shamanic plant or shamanic medicine because it's a plant, a psychoactive plant, usually a, a psychedelic or a hallucinogen that is used in one of these shamanic traditions, right? So it's appropriate to call it a shamanic medicine, um, it, although the same, the very same plant and the very same substance could be not shamanic if you're not using it in a shamanic context. If you're using it recreationally or taking it as in a rave or some other situation, it's not really a shamanic medicine anymore. It's still the same substance, but if you're talking about substances that are used specifically sort of in this shamanic context, then I like shamanic medicine. I have problems with the term entheogen, although I know that it's gotten you know, more popular. Uh, uh, after Carl Ruck, who was a classicist, and Jonathan Ott and some other people proposed it as an alternative to hallucinogen. Um, and theogen means uh, manifesting the God within, in theos, within and God. And that's fine, except they don't always do that. I don't like the word um, because I'm a Buddhist and I don't believe in gods, you know. So, you know, it's, to, to me, it's something which, it, um, which helps you to reach your full potential. It, you don't need to introduce the idea of God. I like the term because I have turned very mystical, you know, since taking LSD. And uh, so my outlook is more skewed in that direction. Um, I think that uh, what uh, Groff said was that it was a non-specific amplifier of your mental states, uh, the psychedelic or hallucinogen or uh, fantastica, you know, uh, the psychotomimetic, you know, all of these uh, qualities that have been ascribed to the same class of sacraments that we now refer to as entheogens, um, I think it's closer for me to the ultimate purpose for which these substances can be used. Uh, the capacity for the human being to experience infinite love and total self-forgiveness a sense of deep interconnectedness with the planet and with all people and with the cosmos. Uh, this uh, plasticity of our identity and, uh, and helping us to see into realms that um, perhaps are both ancient uh, because they're the archetypal divine imagination and they're ever fresh, you know, because it is transcendental presence that is the creator, the artist, the uh, cosmic artist, you know. Entheogen, that it means connecting with God. Um, I've been searching for God all my life. I was a practicing Catholic for many, many years and you would think that psychedelics, you know, being mind manifesting, would show you the God you've been worshiping. The, the closest I ever got to God was that, hey Nick, you're God. You're, you're an aspect of divinity that's looking out uh, at this, you know, a little spy for God. Um, and so enjoy it. 
I said, well, that's a twist. I've been looking for a God outside me. And here I, I learned that I'm one of God's um, apostles in a way. What a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I learned from psychedelics. That, mm -hmm. that uh, at least that's a hypothesis. So pay attention, you know, that was the message. Pay attention, Nick. You're, you're, you're collecting data for God. Look, look, look with God's eyes upon the world. So the term hallucinogen is inaccurate. The term um, psychotomimetic is inaccurate. The term entheogen is, you know, it all depends on circumstances. My personal preference is I like psychedelic because even though the term carries all this cultural baggage, you know, and everything's psychedelic, uh, and that's, that's uh, kind of something left over from the 60s. But in the strict sense, psychedelic means mind manifesting. And I like the term because it leaves it open. I mean, these substances certainly manifest the mind in some aspect and we don't have you know we don't have any argument with that but how they manifest it uh, you know it depends on set and setting and like these other terms you know sort of are more specifically related to set and setting uh, and, and they also show how difficult it is to really linguistically kind of put this in a box you know characterize what they do you know, sometimes they're mystical, sometimes they're uh, psych induced psychosis, sometimes they don't do much of anything at all, you know, but, but they always manifest the mind in some way. So I like psychedelic, if, I could, if it could just be divorced from, you know, all the connotations that it's come to have in our culture. I think uh, it's almost inevitable that uh, psychedelics have been playing a part in uh, religious, mystical experiences since the beginning of time. They are a powerful way for human beings to blow their little egos out of the water and contact the divine. I mean, one thing, you know, the whole of spirituality has its roots, its ancient roots, in the shamanic traditions. Mm. We still have those traditions, yeah. and a, a huge number of them are based on whatever the indigenous psychedelic happens to be in that area. Mm. Because what could be more natural than you pick up a mushroom or something like that, you ingest it, and my God, you're having visions. You're seeing life in a new way. You're seeing through the appearances. You have a greater understanding, or at least your, your, the confines of your common sense understanding is exploded. And it's transformational. They elicit a whole spectrum of psychological effects. Uh, probably the ones that people find most interesting uh, as far as alterations of consciousness. Um, they have profound perceptual effects, emotional effects, cognitive effects. Um, they have effects on your sense of self and on uh, your relationship um, to your body and to your will. Uh, you know, so they kind of cut across the entire spectrum of human consciousness. It's rare that people rush to repeat it, you know, over and over again regularly. It's not that you have a craving to take the drug. Uh, you have a curiosity about the experience and you often have to overcome your reluctance to take the drug in order to have that. You see this with ayahuasca very strongly. You know, if you drink lots of ayahuasca, you actually develop a physiological uh, uh, aversion syndrome. Uh, you know, and this is well known where, with other substances, where it tastes so bad and you get sick and all that, and you, you actually, you know, really don't want to consume it, you know, but you do, and somehow, you always get it down and, and some and you're always glad you did, you know, because you overcome the aversion and you're you learn so much from it, you know. But it's it's definitely not addicting. <laughs> Quite the opposite. I, I think it is possible for people to have an abusive relationship with a psychedelic drug, although compared to the other drugs of abuse, um, that's certainly a lot less common. For example, the kinds of relationships that most people have with heroin or 
alcohol or tobacco, um, those kinds of drugs. Um, you know, psychedelics as a rule anyway uh, tend to be taken sparingly, um, you know, once a week, once a month, once a year, um, as opposed to daily. And in fact, in the case of most of the, cl of the classical psychedelic drugs, um, like LSD, you know, psilocybin, DMT, um, if you take them regularly, you quickly develop tolerance um, and you stop responding, um, especially strongly after the you know, second or, th or third day uh, that you take a psychedelic drug. Um, that's not quite the case with DMT, but uh, you know, the debilitating effects of DMT you know, tend to limit its repetitive habitual use as well. No, there's no evidence that entheogens are addictive. I mean, uh, ayahuasca or mushrooms or peyote are, are, are definitely, or iboga, are definitely not addictive substances. I mean, you can take them and not take them again for years. I mean, they can be a little bit psychologically addictive, like any experience. If somebody really loves it, they may want to go back and have the experience again and again. But generally, you really don't find abusive patterns with people who make use of these substances. Look in your... Uh own pharmacopoeia, you know, look at the drugs that you're taking and, uh, and note their side effects. And how many people a year have died from inhaling marijuana? Goose egg. Now, uh, look at how many people uh, die from uh, drinking alcohol. You know, you've got hundreds and thousands of people. You've got the people who are uh, completely distraught over the um, uh, alcohol addiction and things like this. It's countless billions of dollars and millions of lives are, you know, think of the people that get creamed when the drunk driver, you know, hurts someone. So there's, there's so many repercussions that are much worse with alcohol, and yet it's legal. And uh, so the, the uh, idiocy of our current um, position on uh, cannabis is really sad. Uh, but my prayer is that the grassroots uh, movement uh, will continue to show its uh, obvious uh, advantage to our culture by a kind of strict integration and taxing and, uh, you know, um, so making it a uh, legally available substance, uh, which I think would also make us a little more uh, willing to note the uh, importance of the entheogens because, in a sense, it's a mild entheogen, cannabis. Uh, at the same time, we've, we've, we've conflated them with other substances like heroin and speed and cocaine, which uh, are more uh, addictive, more artificial, where, we, where we've taken, in the case of heroin and cocaine, we took naturally occurring plant substances, but then we did a chemical process to them to kind of amp up the active component and, and, and separate it. So I have a friend, uh, Morgan is an herbalist, and he makes a distinction between you know, the whole plant medicine approach that indigenous people were mostly um, you know, using and our kind of attitude of just isolating the agent that, that causes a certain reaction and, that, and then amplifying that, that effect so that it leads to addictive patterns. A culture is what it eats and an individual's personality is uh, often largely a reflection of their diet. There has not been a human culture uh, that did not bear upon it the stamp of its relationship to certain plants which altered the individual and mass psyche. 
We can think of numerous examples, the influence, for instance, of sugar on the growth of 19th century mercantilism, or the way in which the British manipulated opium policy in the Far East, or, as you mentioned, uh, alcohol, which has always been the drug of choice uh, in Western culture. Who can imagine modern industrial office culture without coffee? These are major drug dependencies that have placed their stamp on the lives of millions and millions of people. It's simply that we choose to linguistically define it in such a way that the effect is not something most people are cognizant of. It's funny that, that, that all of these things are, are lumped under one um, label, drugs. Uh, I come from a, a sort of a peasant family. Uh, and my, both my parents were farmers and uh, were just immigrants, basically. And when my mother found out that I was in California, that I took drugs, it broke her heart. And there was no way that I could explain to her what it was I was doing, because that word drug just had such an impact on her mind that it was about the worst thing what her, her firstborn son could ever do. And it was, a, you know, it was one of the saddest things in my life that I could not explain to mom what it was I was doing. Mom was a very religious person. She went to Catholic church every day, you know, and I, I could not find a way to tell her that I was doing the same thing that she was doing. Uh, and I still, you know, would not know how to tell mom you know, what the difference was between her going to church and me taking in the engines, searching for God through chemicals. There's no such thing as a bad drug, right? Because a drug is just a drug. It's a substance with certain properties. There, it has no moral qualities. The only thing that has moral qualities is human behavior. And there is lots of bad human behavior with respect to drugs. And there's lots of bad human behavior with respect to all kinds of things, you know, and good human behavior too. I mean, again, this comes back to, you know, the context. So the whole war on drugs idea and the idea you know, it has nothing to do with protecting people from toxic substances, you know. If that were the purpose of the war on drugs, tobacco and alcohol, you know, would be prohibited tomorrow. And yet, the structure of the law, not that prohibition would do any good, and I'm not advocating that, right, but if that were really the agenda for drug control, they would say, well, these are clearly the most harmful drugs. These are the ones that are killing the most people. So they should be strictly regulated. But in fact, the way the law is set up, the FDA is not even allowed to classify tobacco and alcohol as a drug. There are these science fiction cliches like there is some knowledge man should not know. So probably there are there are probably horrible things like huge devils or that 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 uh, places where you shouldn't go. You know viruses that were, that 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 would kill all life on Earth or, or or huge like things that make the atomic bomb. I mean, terrible things. That, so what does our, our society ha has a right to make those things not investigatable by science because they're too dangerous. So our society decides that among those things is marijuana. That scientists should not be able to explore marijuana and MDMA and LSD and these, these certain molecules because there are things men should not know. And I think that's, as a scientist, that's laughable. Uh, it, 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 and I, as, I, as I often like to say, if they, I, I got my degree in nuclear physics, and I like to say, if they trusted me with plutonium, why not LSD? <laughs> my gosh. So this makes no sense. So, okay, if, that's, if the war on drugs is not about protecting people from uh, harmful substances, what is it about? Why are all these substances illegal? It's about control. And ultimately, it's about control of what people can think. And 
It's the control of experience. It's essentially the state irrigating itself to the point where it says, you know, certain states of consciousness are allowed and other states of consciousness are not allowed. And that's really what it comes down to. This is about cognitive liberty. There are these uh, you know, plants that have these molecules that humans may have used for thousands of years uh, that produce visions and so on, and are often considered to be healing. In our cultures, we've demonized some of these substances and, and made them illegal, uh, which I would consider to be unfortunate. It's the state saying, you know, don't go there because if you take this entheogen or you take this psychedelic, you're going to have funny ideas. And funny ideas are very dangerous, especially if they don't fit in with, you know, what we're saying should be, you know, kind of the accepted cultural zeitgeist. So that's the danger of psychedelics, is they actually cause people to question the cultural paradigms and say, well, you know, maybe this is not consistent with, uh, you know, maybe the revelations of psychedelics are not consistent with what Hollywood and Wall Street and the government and Main Street and, you know, religions and all these institutions are dis dishing out. So the war on drugs is really a war on consciousness and who's allowed to think what. More importantly, I personally don't believe that anybody has the right to tell you what to do with your own body or what thoughts that you can think. That if you do not have the freedom to decide what happens to your own body and your own mind, then you really don't have freedom at its most basic essential level. Yeah, I think it's really ridiculous that they won't allow terminal cancer patients to take whatever fucking drug they want. I mean, you can't argue it's going to be dead. If you're going to die anyway, uh, why can't you take any drug you like? And, and the extension of that is once you pass a certain age, I don't know quite what that age should be, you should be able to do anything you fucking want to your body without, without being prosecuted. So scientists and old people should have free access to any drugs they want. I, I think I qualify in both counts. So, uh, but you know, our society, is, that, I don't even think that's enlightened. I think that's common sense. An enlightened society would, would take a look at these drugs objectively and say which ones can help promote uh, and would, do, we want a, do we want a society based on alcohol and cocaine or do you want a society based on LSD, MDMA, ayahuasca? Uh, which are the drugs we're going to promote? And our society has picked for some reason, the absolute worst drugs to, to make as its, as its uh, standards. Potentially, psychedelic drugs could be for psychology what the telescope became for the science of astronomy. In the right set and setting, with the right kind of psychotherapy support or religious support or whatever the context of the support is, and, and most importantly, what the person's intention is when they take it. If they're an addict or an alcoholic, they can take ayahuasca, they can take peyote, they can take these substances, and it will definitely help them to get over that. Uh, and in the case of something like ibogaine, it's, it's even more specific. I mean, there's other things going on with ibogaine that might interrupt the addiction syndrome on, on, the, on the physical level. For many people, actually, who were alcoholics and things like that, many of have been cured by their use of psychedelics. So in some ways, it's the opposite of um, addiction. Entheogens actually are almost the opposite of an addicting drug in that sometimes a person will only take 
an entheogen once and have a very powerful experience and actually be freed from some other addictions or habits that he or she might have. And in fact, uh, in some Ibogaine research, an Af African drug called Ibogaine, people are being taken off of heroin and alcohol uh, with some good success uh, where other methods have failed. I discovered Abu again pretty much uh, 11 years ago on the internet back home to a friend of mine which uh, uh, I, I, I gave a, a, a treatment. It was uh, in a uh, heroin. He was uh, heroin addicted. So I treat him with the root because I, I never use abogaine for the for detox. No, I always use, use a straight root. So when he went back to his country, that's how he learned about abogaine and he sent me an email. I'm like, whoa, oh, that's, that's, that's very interesting. So abogaine is a uh, an extraction from Iboga. So you take the root itself, you do the extraction, and it became the first like a total alkaloid. Now Ibogaine is very effective at treating certain kinds of addiction, opiates, uh, methamphetamines, cocaine, and alcohol. Ibogaine has five different therapies that we basically became aware in their use. One is in an initiatory, uh, an initiatory aspect, which is the psychospiritual, um, where you get into the deeping dreaming aspects, but you have no active addiction in the body. The second is for physical healing, things like herpes, uh, asthma, uh, lung problems, uh, blocked energies in the system, scar tissue. Then there is also a uh, mental treatment for disabilities around depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, trauma, sexual abuse. Then there's a reset therapy that we do with alcohol, cocaine, and methamphetamine. Um, we separate that because those, those substances need to be out of the body for 24 to 72 hours prior to treatment. And then there's opiate. And in opiate detox, we can begin 12 hours after last administering of an opiate. And within 45 minutes, it will completely control any symptoms of withdrawals. I even do... Uh, uh, the healing for let's say for for women who is have who wanting to have kids, and let's say they, let's say they try in hospital, you know, in, in the dark there say you know you can't have kids anymore, but the woman is normal. It's like nothing is missing in the, the, the tummy. Why she can't have kids? I do the healing that of that riboga. Something that's been discovered recently uh, by Dr. Deborah Mash and others is that there is a new neurotransmitter created in the brain after taking Ibogaine called noribogaine. And it can stay in your uh, system for up to four months. And that's the substance that they theorize is continually working on your psyche to make that reduction of cravings stay in place so that you know over the long term you have time to break out of that cycle of addiction and become a new person. Not only is it uh, address the symptoms of withdrawals and discomfort but it also works in the craving center of the mind so the individual by the time they've completed treatment has no desire whatsoever within a 10 days to two week period to touch opiates. See, that's pretty much the reason why I'm here in the West. I didn't just decide to come here. You know, I love my country and we really peaceful there. Life is also great like here in Mexico. You know, I would not just like leave my people, whatever I were, I were, I were doing, my family, just to come here to hang out. Now, I had a call from the spirit to spray the roots, the word of the root, Iboga which is like them talking with Abogain to spray in the world because it's not just for Africans, it's for anybody who needs it. If it was just up to me, I would just like, okay, let's go from city to city, clean up the streets, 
cleaning up the houses. You know, we're gonna find those guys, with, you know, with the drug addict. We're gonna find them and heal them all. Because that's the only way. This, that Iboga and, and, and Abogan is a last call for anybody who really wants to get help. You don't have to spend like thousands and thousands of dollars or, or, or spend months in a clean rehab and go back tomorrow and do, using the drugs. No, it takes just a couple of days to get here and I'm ready to do, the, you know, to do that, to help anybody who wants to take it. Just one decision, that's it, that's all it takes. But the thing is, I've also known many people who take a lot of psychedelics and they're heroin addicts, they're alcoholics, it hasn't helped them a bit. So, you know, honesty behooves me to say that. This is not a miracle cure for addiction. All these things can do is like open up a, an opportunity for the person to examine their lives and resolve to change if that's what they want to do but it won't compel them to change, you know. It's not gonna force anybody off, off drugs. Um, so, you know, it's like a lot of other techniques for treating addiction, talk therapy or whatever. Um, they work in some people and not in other people. Since it's illegal in the United States, the only options that an addict has is to go out of the country or to do it illegally in the United States. And there are some people in the United States who are treating addicts illegally. You know, they're breaking the law by healing these people. Uh, however, most people uh, go to other countries to take Ibogaine. I personally, I went to Mexico around the Puerto Vallarta area with an organization called AwakeningInTheDream.com. And that was a great experience for me. And the people there were super nice and it was in a setting that I think was beneficial to the Ibogaine experience. In other words, it wasn't in a clinic, it was in a house. And I was with people who were very experienced at doing this and I felt completely safe. Um, but there are several clinics in Mexico doing this. Some of them are just right across the border in Tijuana. And there's lots of clinics around the world that will take your money and give you Ibogaine. They've never taken Ibogaine. They don't know anything about drug addiction and they have no idea what that individual is going through in that process. You know, and that just frightens the hell out of me. I mean, in comparison to what the model in the United States, this is not a return visit, um, uh, a revolving door therapy house. We're hoping you can come here once get rid of that addiction, and when you come back again to do more work with the Ibogaine, if it benefited you, you know, without an addiction in the body, because then you can go to the next level, and then you work to the next level. And this could be a real supportive, you know, this isn't like going to meetings every day and believing that you're never gonna be anything less than what you are. This confirms that you are no longer hit in the body energetically. There is no physical addiction existing in the system. It enables them to release from the addictive need, actually. They found themselves after their trips uh, without the desire for junk. And uh, they were all shocked, you know, like, oh my God, this is a, you know, because they were like waiting for the other shoe to drop. Uh, but then they actually felt like, wow, I am not hooked, you know. So there was something immediately uh, engaging about it. On the other hand, it was also very psychologically challenging to begin with. Uh, and, you know, it took one into a very deep inner world. You, maybe you were going to face some of the shadows that has uh, been part of your addictive process. This really sort of crosses over into the shamanic use of these things. I mean, the shaman is a person who learns through discipline to navigate in these realms. And this is the realm of, you know, he learns to pass through both ways, through the doors that the dead pass daily. Um, I think that high doses of uh, psychedelics or something like DMT 
is very close probably. I mean, I, I've never had a near-death experience. I hope never to have one until until I'm actually dying, <laughs> you know. But people who have had them say that they're very similar to high doses of DMT. And there's even reason to think that the DMT, which our own bodies make, may be involved in the near-death experience. That, you know, in, in the state of stress on the mind and body that is produced when you're dying, it's not inconceivable that you your brain releases a massive flood of DMT and you have this experience. But all this still is mostly within the realm of speculation. Um, we still don't really know enough about uh, the normal concentrations of DMT in the body and what situations increase it and in what uh, sorts of conditions the levels are decreased. Where is DMT found in nature? Um, well, a better question would be where is, where is it not found in nature? Um, I mean, this is, this is really interesting to me. The fact that DMT is so ubiquitous in nature. Um, and it, it's, it's part, it, it, is, it is, from the chemical standpoint, structurally, it's the simplest of the psychedelics. It's a very, very simple compound. And, and in terms of biochemistry, it's only two steps away from tryptophan. Tryptophan is an amino acid. It's one of the essential amino acids. So it is universal. All living things have tryptophan. Uh, now, not all living things have DMT, probably, but but the enzymes that convert tryptophan to DMT, there are two main enzymes in this process, are also universal. I mean, I don't know how chemical we want to get here, but the basic idea is that there's an enzyme that takes off the acid group of the amino acid, so it turns it from an amino acid into an amine, and then there's another uh, enzyme that puts uh, methyl groups onto the amine. So you get, first you get tryptophan, and then you get tryptamine, and then you get dimethyltryptamine, which is what DMT is. And this goes on, I think, very commonly. Uh, well, these enzymes are certainly common. I mean, they're common in all cells, practically. Do all organisms contain DMT? I think it's possible that all organisms might contain traces of DMT. There are many plants that contain DMT. We know of at least a couple hundred, and that's only because we've looked. You know, there are probably thousands of plants. There, in fact, my suspicion is that because tryptophan is so easily converted to DMT, I think if you went out with a sufficiently sensitive instrument, mass spectrometer or whatever, and just started sampling plants at random and shoving those through your gas chromatograph or whatever you're using, you would find traces of DMT in every plant. And you would also find it, we know it's very widespread in animals too. So we know it's in amphibians, we know it's in mammals, including us. We know it's in marine organisms, we know it's in fish. So it's, yeah, it's, it's odd that, well, maybe it's not odd. It's just a fact of nature that it's all over the place. And, and probably is about as close to being universal as, as anything is. It's also related to serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter which occurs in all life and is most concentrated in the higher primates and most concentrated there in man. It is 5-hydroxytryptamine while DMT is, as you mentioned, NN-dimethyltryptamine. So there is a very close structural affinity between this extremely potent and exotic hallucinogen 
and the very common basis for ordinary consciousness, serotonin. DMT and uh, 5-methoxy DMT and, uh, and even beta-carbolines, which are the other component of the, of the ayahuasca combination, do occur in the human brain and they occur in other places in the human body, in the adrenal glands, for instance. Uh, probably in the gut, um, but uh, they definitely occur in the human brain, especially in the pineal gland. There are other forms of DMT other than the smokable kind. In fact, those other forms are the, the more traditionally used forms of DMT, such as ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is remarkable because, uh, as you probably know, it's combined from these two uh, distinct plant species. Its two principal ingredients are themselves inactive except in the presence of each other. So what we have in the case of ayahuasca is an example of a highly evolved folk pharmacology and how a discovery like this was ever made in the first place is one of the challenging questions that anthropologists have to deal with. After all, in a square mile of Amazonian rainforest, it is not unusual to encounter 50,000 distinct species of plants. How then did these uh, so-called primitive or preliterate people make the connection between the combining of the bark of one with the leaves of another boiled and put through a number of procedures to uh, produce an intense visionary hallucinogen. This is an extremely interesting and uh, to this day unanswered question. It tastes horrible, by the way. Uh, it tastes, uh, my uh, version of what it uh, tastes like is uh, maybe four day old espresso that someone had uh, put out a cigarette in um, with a dash of lemon. Uh, <laughs> and so you gag it down and uh, then uh, after a while your, your mind starts to have a, a plasticity and an openness and it remains that way for about uh, four or five hours, which is, uh, can be quite beautiful. If you've seen any of the tapestries of the Inner Mind uh, Cathedral in the uh, DMT state, uh, that extends it for hours. So it's kind of a shame not to take ayahuasca if you're going to do DMT because, uh, geez, you can extend the uh, journey to several hours. Well, DMT is a tryptamine, so is LSD. Um, LSD is a, is, a, is a laboratory invention. Um, it's a chemical modification of an ergot alkaloid. Um, but in terms of their you know, pharmacology, they're quite similar. Uh, they both impact certain kinds of serotonin receptors in the brain, uh, th through which most people propose that these drugs have their effects. Um, you know, the, um, I would say the main difference is uh, that DMT is quite short acting and LSD is quite long acting. Uh, but in terms of this, the, on the spectrum of effects, uh, they're quite comparable in, in terms of the perceptual and emotional and the cognitive responses to consuming the drug or the compound. Um, also DMT is a compound that is you know, found in all kinds of animals and plants, and, and LSD isn't a natural product. Um, it isn't found in the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom. In ayahuasca, the effects of DMT begin a lot slower, probably within a half hour, maybe an hour, and they peak in around two to three hours, and they usually resolve between around um, you know, six hours or so. Um, so even though it's a slower effect, the, the quality of the response is the same. LSD was always a bit of a, uh, 
commitment because that you've got at least eight hours that you're committed to this altered state. And so you have to arrange your life wisely to support that. And uh, this is just a little more manageable, I think, uh, in some ways. It's also very clean and very clear. And you don't feel any body load afterward. You feel uplifted. You feel like vitalized. You feel like you need less sleep, you know? And you feel uh, that you've addressed yourself on a deep level. A lot of uh, deep issues came up for me. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I've had experiences with ayahuasca and ibogaine. They've been very profound and important experiences in my life. And uh, they've helped me, I, I feel, to grow on, on many levels. I mean, I've written about them extensively in my books, Breaking Open the Head and 2012 with the Return of Quetzalcoatl. I feel like they gave me insights into my personal psychology, uh, visions about better paths to take. They kind of uh, acted as kind of antidepressants that lifted my spirits up and made me see these other layers or possibilities of reality. So they, they've been very important experiences for me. Telepathic and group mind states are induced by this particular plant mixture and it's particularly interesting in the light of the fact that the chemical constituents which make it go are in fact found endogenously in the human brain. These are not exotic compounds from the point of view of ordinary human brain chemistry. So there is a suggestion there that uh, manipulation of neurohumoral compounds, brain neurotransmitters and that sort of thing may in fact open the door to uh, untapped areas of human potential. One of the games my, my brother liked to play with the mushrooms was, you know, in this dialogue situation, he was always saying, tell me something I can't possibly know, right? And that will validate that it's not me, you know, that this is coming from. I don't know that he ever succeeded in getting it. It's very cagey, you know, they're very tricky that way. It's, you know, uh, but occasionally they do seem to tell people things that they can't possibly know or that they've never thought about in, the, in quite that way. Now it's come out, for example, that, uh, you know, Crick's insight into the structure of DNA was was assisted by LSD, you know, and he reluctantly but finally admitted that that was a big influence. And many computer scientists, you know, Steve Jobs has said LSD's been very useful for his creativity. Terry Mullis, the Nobel Prize winner who, who figured out the, the PCR chain reaction has, has been quite upfront about it. LSD gave him the ability to get down with the molecules and see what's happening. In, in some sense, it, there is a communication. In some sense, the question isn't even valid because where do the boundaries between the self and the world exist? You know, we're not really separate. I mean, we're part of this information field. And, you know, this notion that consciousness, I mean, I, I do think that consciousness does, it's, it's like a property of the continuum. It's like the old physical physicist concept of the ether or something. It kind of permeates everything. And uh, it's not really localized in the human brain or necessarily even generated by the human brain. Why does the brain require DMT for normal function if you know, this is indeed true? Um, 
Yeah, and it's hard to say. I, I mean, I think that perhaps one of the functions of ordinary levels of DMT is kind of like a, you know, kind of reality thermostat. Um, if you have a certain kind of narrow window of, of levels of DMT in the brain, um, it maintains this ordinary level of, you know, perceptual, you know, consensus reality that most of us live in. You know, kind of like the endo matrix in a way, as opposed to like an externally applied, you know, psychological or, you know, uh, consciousness kind of matrix like in the movie. Um, you know, this is one um, that's internally generated. But it may be that the brain is a place where it becomes focused and concentrated. You know, the brain m may be as much a receiver of the signal as it is a generator of the signal. You know, nobody can really say, but that's, that model in some ways appeals more to me than the notion that it's all coming from the brain. The brain is more like a, a node, you know, and there's this sort of field of, of consciousness that permeates everything, and to a certain degree, everything is conscious. I think of the shaman as entering into this net of being, uh, in the higher worlds, in the heaven worlds, and that's why I've personified the net of being, this painting behind us, as this continuum of heads interlocking infinitely in all directions, because that points to being as a continuum, as a network, in a sense, uh, to an infinite realm. And this is a part of the deep fabric of our being, I think because we sense ourselves as souls related to many. There is this everyday world, but you can be in a place where there is no you and still perceive the world. That scared me. L losing my ego was the scariest thing I ever, and I still don't like it. A profound state which may be reached uh, by use of these entheogens, psychedelics, hallucinogens, whatever you're going to call them, uh, which is known as ego loss or ego death. Unfortunately, um, subsequent to the coinage of this term, ego has come to be used in a completely other sense. It has been used in the sense of pride, and that is not what ego death is about. I mean, ego death would mean you lose your sense of I for good. And that's not what happens. They mean a temporary uh, suspension of the ego when, when ego death is, is spoken of. Ego death means the death of you as a concept. Whereas we walk around thinking of ourselves as things. We think of I am sitting in the chair. Therefore, you know, I am a thing. The chair is a thing. When we reach the realm of ego death or ego dissolution or whatever you're going to call it, there is no longer any perceived boundary between oneself and the chair. In this state, there are no things. There is just one continuous experience. In some sense, all of experience is an illusion, you know. Everything that we experience in the here and now in our state of being is a hallucination, an elaborate hallucination that our brains construct. We happen to call it consensus reality, but it's still, I mean, I mean physics tells us that, you know, the, the picture of reality that we build so that we can navigate through the world and not step in front of buses and stuff like that and do all those, uh, you know, the world doesn't really look like this at all. You know, the, the brain constructs a model of reality that more or less maps onto reality. It's good enough that we can survive. But we're focused in a kind of, uh, you know, constricted dimensional awareness of reality and you know for safety reasons mostly you know and we don't necessarily want to know that we are actual one consciousness with all beings and things at all times 
So nevertheless, those dimensions are all open to our being. You know, we have a complete freedom of the continuum of being. If we change the nature, you know, we have the model and we have the real world out here and we have the sensory neural interface that's taking this information in, interpreting it, and giving us the model. If we change the nature of the sensory neural interface a, a little or a lot, if we substitute, say, DMT for serotonin, you know, the model of the world that we get changes radically. And who's to say that that's any less valid than the model that, you know, the brain constructs for, uh, you know, for everyday purposes. So this idea that, you know, I mean, it's, it's all illusion. It's all hallucination. That's what experience is, you know. I mean, that's why in some ways I sometimes get a little impatient with, with people that say, you know, well, a drug experience cannot possibly have any spiritual validity. Well, I'm here to tell you that all experience is a drug experience. You know, we're all on drugs all the time, largely because we're made of drugs, you know, and that's what drives us. You know, experience is you know, sort of the, the, what issues out of this biochemical process of, you know, all these neurotransmitters and hormones moving around our brain. I mean, it's drugs. We've gotten very stuck on the idea that like we're conscious and sentient and, you know, intelligent and have knowledge and that nothing else in the world of nature really is like that. But actually, you know, we're a very young experiment on the planet. We're a young species, and, and the this plant world has been around uh, for a really long time. The fungus world, even even longer than that, and they they've developed uh, you know a symbiotic meshworks of species interrelationship, very complicated diplomacy, interspecies diplomacy, and it, and it may be that certain plants have been kind of. Uh, anointed or given the role to be the uh, the diplomats and, and the teachers who work with uh, the human species to help us to see if we can evolve to be uh, less destructive before before we sort of just lose our shit and, and, and top off the biosphere. Maybe the ubiquity of DMT is, a, is a, you know, signature of consciousness in nature or nature sending a, a message to you know the, the big brain stupid primates you know wake up look around it's everywhere you know mind is everywhere i think that their message is wake up dummy you know uh before you you kill us all here uh on the one hand and the other hand they're saying wake up to your own divinity wake up to your uh, higher capacities. So they're talking to us every day, which is true. But no, we don't, we're not listening because it's like when you get up in the morning, you go straight to work, you work after, after, after you know, your day, you get off, you go home, or you stop at the restaurant, eat a good meal and go home, that's it, you go to sleep, the next day you do the same thing. So to answer your question, herbs, our spirit talking to us every day. Just be ready and to, 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 you know, to know what is it, what it's trying to tell me. I mean, you have these experiences and you seem to have a communication, right? And very often they, they present themselves as an intelligence, something outside yourself, you know, and you're communicating with it. You're having a dialogue or some feeling of, you know, an other that you're interacting with. Um, whether it is a illusion or not, it's hard to, it's, it's really hard to know. Psychedelics sort of make people aware of realms that are less material, you know, that, that the real sort of, the really rewarding experiences are not necessarily what Wall Street or Madison Avenue or Hollywood wants to deliver to you. I mean, they, 
those experiences and they're synthetic experiences just as much as a drug experience is a synthetic experience but they're usually tied with some consumerist you know agenda and I mean this is part of the the, the sort of the the inconsistent attitude of of society I mean they want they meaning I don't know the corporate hegemony or whatever I and mean, they want people to be addicted to things they want people to consume things and not necessarily to drugs but drugs will do I mean they want people to drink and smoke and all these things you know and they and they want people to be addicted to their to their cars and computers and, and TV and all that so you know a lot of what it's about is kind of keeping people uh, entertained and focused on these sort of corporate uh, corporately massaged corporately created versions of, of reality The business of culture, any culture, is to perpetuate its cultural models. And if the hallucinogenic plants have not been integrated into the cultural model, then they are definitely seen as dangerous forces for an unpredictable sort of social change. Mm -hmm. Now, if the hallucinogenic plants have been integrated into the cultural model, this is not then a problem. And this is the case with shamanism. Shamanism is the uh, culturally sanctified institution of uh, inner exploration via psychoactive plants. Where psychoactive plants are not present, shamanic institutions tend to become vitiated to rely on ritual or ordeals or uh, other methods of eliciting, eliciting these ecstatic states. Well, the uh, contemporary artist, therefore, has felt a great kinship with the shaman because the archetype of the contemporary artist is that they stand askance from or ajar from uh, conventional culture. And therefore, these are the creative artists, we hope. Uh, therefore, they contribute a different perspective uh, on ourselves and something that we can uh, learn from. And I think that uh, that's part of the role of sacred art, ultimately, is to show us a higher model of what we can be uh, so that we're pulled toward our highest potential uh, rather than having our negative uh, or materialist sense reinforced. We get that through a lot of our other materialist and very rational culture. Entheogens are inherently threatening to, to the culture. I mean, that's, I think, one reason that they're brutally suppressed, both when, when capitalist cultures or dominant cultures come on indigenous cultures, you know, they're usually bringing another religion, an outside religion, Christianity or whatever, usually incompatible with the indigenous practices. So that's the first thing to go and the first thing to be attacked. And along with that goes the knowledge of these plants. The church was concerned that the magic of the witches be seen as real, number one, and number two, entirely caused by the agency of the devil himself. And so the church downplayed the operational role that plants had in inducing these states because, after all, if the devil cannot uh, lead you astray without the use of plants, why, what kind of devil is it? So in our own uh, historical tradition, there is a curious blindness to the efficacy of hallucinogenic plants. You know, it is possible that as the visionary experience becomes more acceptable in our contemporary postmodern culture, um, more and more people may gravitate to those types of experience. And at the same time, we can already see that the traditional religious structures are in a lot of trouble 
uh, they're causing a lot of trouble in the world, uh, it, it probably would be beneficial for there to be a kind of consciousness evolution out of fundamentalist belief systems. And, uh, you know, I think that the shamanic experience might be helpful in that, in that evolutionary process. As institutions, what they have in common is they discourage individual thought and they discourage critical thinking and they discourage questions, questioning. Um, they encourage that, okay, here is a body of beliefs or cultural norms or, you know, a largely accepted beliefs and you're just supposed to accept it, you know. Don't ask questions, sit down and shut up. You know, accept it and integrate it and be a good, you know, citizen, consumer, whatever the role is decided. And theogens are inherently threatening because they enable people or sometimes they compel people to reject that. You know, and say, well, maybe there's more to life than, uh, you know, working in a cubicle for some faithless, faceless corporation so I can, you know, not have health insurance and die sick and, you know, without a pension and, you know, and just spend my time with that. Maybe it encourages people to, uh, you know, look, at, look for different purposes in life than that. So that's really, I think, what's going on. The problem with the psychedelics is that they um, dissolve cultural programming and hence inherently have a political charge about them. And actually that's the weakness, you know, of what I have, I'm sort of beginning to to call the death culture, you know, um, and and these things then actually become, in a sense, our own bioweapons, or if we're on the other side of, of this divide, then these plants, you know, especially the plants, become very dangerous in this context. You know, they're trying to suppress them, but you can't suppress them. and. Their, you know, their ways of changing hearts and minds. So they are definitely very, very uh, dangerous. Um, but they can be used in a creative way to counteract kind of the toxic uh, message that the the mainstream culture puts out. I put a lot of time into making sacred art in order to download the shamanic and entheogenic and meditative and uh, you know just grace and dream and shamanic journey and all of these uh, kinds of modes of uh, and highly rational thinking about uh, philosophically what are the implications of the worldview that I'm expressing and things like that because for me, the artist, uh, at perhaps at their best, could be, uh, I love that word, scintilla, you know, Terence always used, could be the scintilla of evolving consciousness, um, as we all can be, you know, but they could express it visually. And in fact, there are images that appear to be of the fly agaric mushroom in some early Christian art. The fresco at Plain Coral is one example of this. And it appears to be a Adam and Eve standing next to this big fly agaric mushroom that has sprouts coming off of it. It's not, it's not depicted in exactly the way a fly agaric grows, but the, the, uh, the stalk is there in the cap of the mushroom and it has white flecks on top. It looks very much like an Amanita muscaria mushroom. 
Now this has been debated by art scholars saying that no, this is just the style that was used, a figurative style, to paint, a way to paint trees. But why though, you, you have to ask, would you start painting trees that looked like mushrooms? Unless perhaps you were trying to get across another message in that painting. In the ceiling of the Hildesheim Cathedral in Germany, painted, I think, in 1100, this era, there's a striking image, similar, very similar to the Plain Keralt fresco of Adam and Eve, again, standing not, not next to a tree like Amanita, but standing in front of, a, of a, what looks like a flyagaric cap behind them, uh, tilted on so it's facing the, the viewer. So it's round like this, and Adam and Eve are standing in front of it. Not only is it perfectly round like an Amanita cap, not only does it have uh, white spots, these are actually are silver spots spread out over like the, like the veil remnants, white veil remnants on an Amanita cap, but these are actually metallic hemispheres, silver metallic hemispheres that are attached to the painting. So they're actually raised bumps, just like you'll find on the cap of a mushroom. The, the veil remnants are, are white flecks that can even be removed. So this was, a, in my opinion, this was a, uh, an intentional clue by the artist to show people what, they, what was really being shown here, what the fruit of the Garden of Eden really was, according to the artist and according to Allegro and Wasson as well, that the fruit of the Garden of Eden was in fact the fly agaric mushroom. It's just such a damn attractive mushroom, I have to say. It distinguishes itself by its beauty. I can't think of a more beautiful mushroom, really. At the same time, I can think of one that takes you a lot higher in terms of its uh, uh, psychedelic potency and entheogenic potential. Uh, I've never had much of a holy experience on a Amanita. Uh, it was slightly more of a deliriant and a body uh, wank than a, um, you know, something that would elevate you to the heavenly spheres, you know. It's the iconic mushroom, in a sense. I mean, it's the archetypal mushroom that goes way, way back to at least the Paleolithic. We know that Siberian shamanism is where the whole thing is thought to have originated and that that was, uh, a lot of that constellated around Amanita. And, you know, the classic shamanic uh, motifs of the ascending the world tree and having the axis mundi that, that links the celestial and the earthly and the underground realms and in Siberian shamanism this is often depicted as a mushroom. I've encountered the Amanita muscaria mushroom and its symbolism actually in the material around the Finnish Kalevala, the uh, national epic of Finland. It was collected together as an oral tradition in the 19th century and was called the Kalevala. And it's the ancient legends of Finland. And there's an artifact or an idea or a concept in the Kalevala called the Sampo. And the Sampo is kind of this magic mill that's capable of producing anything you wish. And it's really a cosmological metaphor for the starry sky centered on the pole star. And the stars are called the ciphered cover, so it's envisioned as, as this huge sort of umbrella-like thing that spins slowly with the central axis coming down. So it's also an, a huge image of the Amanita muscaria mushroom as a cosmological metaphor. Muscamol, uh, which is the active main psychoactive principle in Amanita muscaria, is a very potent GABA Agonist, so it interacts specifically with these receptors and not much and not at all with the serotonin receptors except possibly indirectly. So, how can Amanita muscaria produce these transcendent experiences? Um, and there are several possible answers. Maybe they don't. 
you know, I, I personally am not familiar enough with Hominidae muscaria to say that they do. Uh, my own experience with Hominidae was very limited because I didn't, I, I didn't enjoy it, but I also, it didn't seem like a transcendent experience at all. It seemed like a, a cheap drunk in a way, but I dealt with, uh, you know, I was eating fresh mushrooms and it's almost always taken dried. Uh, I think there's a great deal of chemical variation in the mushrooms, both geographically, there are many, there's geographic variation, the mushrooms in the Himalayas and in Siberia may not be the same as the ones in Colorado, just from a chemical angle. Um, there's, you know, so there are many chemical races, you know, of these mushrooms. Some of them may contain true psychedelics. Some of them may contain tryptamines and or beta carbolines. There is some evidence that they do, these DMT and this kind of thing, do show up in some of these things, some of these amanitas. Um, it, it, it's a complicated picture. Nobody has sorted out, you know, I mean, somebody really needs to go through and do two things. They need to collect mushrooms very carefully from different parts of the world and, and do chemical profiles to see if they can define a chemical race or are there certain races that are high in these tryptamines. They also, someone also needs to look at the way that they're prepared because I think uh, I've talked with people, and you have too probably, who, who insist that they are really very psychedelic, but you have to dry them a certain way, and they have to be dried over a fire, they have to be, you know, and the fresh mushrooms don't get it, you know. The phyagaric mushroom, unlike, say, psilocybe species, a psilocybin mushroom, where you can pretty much rely on, you can go by weight, on if you can take the mushroom, a certain amount will give you pretty much a certain experience, level of experience. With the fly agaric, you have no such guarantee. You can have a mushroom as big as a dinner plate that will give you virtually no experience at all, or you can have one uh, much smaller that can knock your socks off, metaphorically speaking. It's because the mushroom contains both muscimol, which is the active ingredient, and uh, a substance called ebotenic acid, which is far, far less uh, active um, but much more toxic. Once it reaches your liver, the liver starts dismantling it and the first thing it does is a decarboxylation process which turns it into muscimol and then it excretes it. So you can actually, depending on the amount of ebotenic acid in the initial sample, uh, you can actually uh, excrete more of the active principle, muscimol, than you ate. And so um, if you were to pass on your urine to somebody else, you'd get higher than you did. Um, purely because, and of course you'll pass on some ebotenic acid too, which he will metabolize into muscimol. And so in Siberia, this is passed from person to person, not rather than being recycled. And, um, and they get five or six people high on the same mushroom. This is very important. This may be the secret of Amanita because it seems to me from what you were saying that it, it's not simply that it goes through. There's, there's a filtering and there's a detoxification process. So the first collection after you eat it has probably got a lot of things um, cleaned out of it that might make for an uncomfortable trip. It may also, um, I mean, this, this is pure speculation, but it's possible that some of the uh, downstream effects of taking these GABA agonists, which is what the Amanita, it might induce the production of endogenous tryptamines, DMT plus beta carbolines, so that the, the person who ate that, mush, that urine or drank that urine after this process might be getting a lot of things that is not 
in the mushrooms, but it's actually secondary metabolites that are produced uh, by the eating of the mushrooms. So, so you get the mushrooms, you eat the mushrooms, and you get all these feedback loops happening, and you get possibly things excreted in the urine, uh, possibly these tryptamines and beta carbolines. I don't know that this is possible, but it's completely reasonable to speculate. There is actually a Tibetan text which is a retelling of the Hindu myth of how Amrita was first made by churning the ocean. But in the Tibetan version, the, the Bodhisattva who's supposed to be looking after the Amrita um, doesn't look after it very well and this demon comes along and steals it. And he doesn't just drink it all, he drinks it and replaces it with his own urine. And then um, the Buddhas uh, decide that the Bodhisattva, Vajrapani, who is looking after it, um, should drink the urine. And he does. And he becomes dark blue, surrounded by flames and ornamented with snakes. Stepping out, that's what, that's what the, the mystical experience is, it's one of ecstasy. Yeah. And whilst it, it's difficult to look at the, specifically, the, at least the Gnostic and Pagan initiations and go, oh, this was what was used, and we don't have that, we can guess, we don't. What we do know is that an initiation, well, first of all, the word, certainly in, in the Greek word that gets used, doesn't mean, like our word, the start of something. It comes from telos, and it means kind of a glimpse of the end of something. So what's happening to you in an initiation is that you're getting a, an experience of where you're going. So you, oh, and then you come back and then you make the journey back to that place and you're finding it in yourself. Now one of the things that psychedelics does is it gives you a glimpse of something which has been kind of given to you from the outside in. You've needed to ingest this thing and something's happened to your consciousness. It's a very powerful way of doing that. So the idea that you could have an initiation, a glimpse of the end, through something which you, is taken into you, through psychedelic, also through the influence of a teacher or, or, or a ritual, or maybe all of it, and then you're on the journey to find that in yourself, because it's already in you. That's what I think is going on, one way or another. It may be the case that there were mystery traditions that made use of psychedelics um, and so, you know, we've lost track uh, in, in our official history of, of what that use was and, and, and what went on. You know, we don't know what they were doing in Egypt. We don't know what the Jews were doing in Sinai. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of kind of uh, alternative archaeology and anthropology, which would sort of tries to work through the, these possibilities. And um, it may be that early Christianity had you know, aspects of a mushroom cult, you know, they're, 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 that may have appeared in these artworks, which definitely are, you know, some of them really are very suggestive of, of mushrooms. However, I think that sometimes there's a tendency in the psychedelic community to almost become like, uh, you know, uh, entheogenic fundamentalists and think that all visionary experience, you know, was mediated by the psychedelic plants and that the origin of all religions was based in, you know, the, the experience of, of using the, these substances. And um, it may be the case, we just don't know. And it may not be the case because people have visionary experiences you know, without psychedelics, I mean, diet, you know, can, you know, you know, fasting, um, drumming, you know, there are all sorts of, there's a whole range, you know, yoga, I mean, there's a whole range of, of types of experiences that, that produce uh, mystical visions, sense of unity with the cosmos. So I, I'm a little resistant to a strain that I often encounter in the, the psychedelic underground of like 
uh, kind of fundamentalism around these experiences. That they were the origin of all genuine religion or whatever. So, um, but they, 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 you know, they probably played more of a part than the official story uh, gives credit to. When religions come in contact with a real mystery, you know, with a really numinous thing, they don't like that because numinous things are inherently dangerous and threatening and a lot of religion has to do with controlling people and you know there needs to be a, a distance between God or the numinous the numinous archetype whatever that is and the people and that's usually the, the priestly hierarchy and the you know the infrastructure around that and and you know the the the, uh, the sort of infrastructure that filters the message. One of the things that stood out in my research in Christianity was the use of the Eucharist. That is, uh, going back to the Last Supper and Jesus' purported words at the time when he dipped the bread and said, this is my body, uh, eat it and have life in you, Without, unless you eat this, you will not have life in you. And this is my blood, and he handed the cup of supposed wine and said, this is, this is my blood, and unless you drink this blood, you will not have life in you. Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you will not have life in you. And this is stressed over and over, especially in John, the book of John in the New Testament. So what could this mean? What, uh, is this all mere symbol? Uh, why, why, why degrade, uh, ostensibly degrade a, a high spiritual experience by likening it to eating the flesh and blood of another human being. That seems uh, counterintuitive and, and completely beside the point, unless these were symbols for something else, for another substance. The, the Christian Eucharist promises a lot and delivers very little in terms of, you know, in other words, you have to believe to get much out of the Christian Eucharist. And if you believe, then you may get, I mean, you won't get a psychedelic experience, but you will get something, you know, an, an affirmation of faith or a feeling that you're, you know, in communication with the Creator. I mean, frankly, to be honest, I don't believe. Uh, I mean, I was raised Catholic, but, um, it never made any sense to me, and, and so I don't believe, so I can't really tell you what a, a devout Christian gets from the Eucharist. What's different about psychedelics is they do deliver something. They deliver an experience if they're taken in the right set and setting, and, and I think one of the main things that sets them aside from, or that distinguishes them from the Eucharist is you don't have to believe, you know. In fact, I tell people faith is not necessary, you know, to experience what psychedelics have to teach. In fact, that's an impediment. Get rid of your faith. Approach it like a scientist, you know. You don't have to believe. You can be as skeptical as you want. You can take the substance in, you can experience it, and you can make your own, own judgments what it's about. If Paul and other people are eating the body of the God and having an incredible visionary, I mean, Paul says, again, it just completely contradicts the idea of a historical Jesus because he says, everything I know about Jesus came to me by revelation. Where is this coming from? What is the source of his experiences? I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean. Uh, a chap called John Allegro many years ago wrote a book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, which was about precisely this. He believes that uh, the cultic meal of sharing the book was people getting together and eating some psychoactive substance together and having revelations of the Holy Spirit, what have you. So. I'm, I'm open to, to any investigations and whatever evidence comes up. You know, I think it's through personal experience, myself, 
one of the most powerful ways to, well, Aldous Huxley himself, when in, uh, is it Heaven and Hell? Doors of Perception. Doors of Perception, when he, see, when he looks at the, um, the bamboo chair, I think it is, and he says, I suddenly, and this is a man who spent his entire life writing about the religious traditions of the world, the mystical traditions of the world, but he never actually had an experience. And here he was on Mescaline, I believe, mm -hmm. looking at this chair suffused with light, and he says, hear all these words that people had used before, like grace and all these mis Suddenly I was having that experience. Alan Watts the same, uh, again a great scholar, actually had the experience in this way. So if that's happening to people today, I think we can safely assume it's been happening to people for a very, very long time. Yeah. Shamanism is like a universal human dispensation wherever people live in connection with their native land and you know it doesn't have to be through plants either I mean, there are tribes that don't use plants that just do all-night ceremonies uh, you know ritualistic drumming there are all sorts of different ways to get people into altered states and actually we're learning more and more about uh, you know brainwave patterns and theta states and alpha states and so on so you know yeah I, I think that you know the the and, and you know as Andrew Weil talks about the the desire the, the sort of almost the necessity for people to tr change their consciousness and experience other states of consciousness seems to be very basic to 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 our human nature and if it's not if people aren't given constructive and creative outlets for those types of experience they'll choose uh, destructive and negative ones just because it's it's just almost natural that we would that we would want to have different types of consciousness experience. Anybody's experience, their subjective personal experience of the mystical has to be considered valid in some respect. They may have a different terministic screen, a, a set of words that they use to describe these mystical experiences and maybe sometimes we don't always agree with those because of the baggage that's associated with them. But we still have to be open to the truth from those experiences before we completely just throw the baby out with the bath water. A mystical experience by any means whatsoever, you know, and if you can do Sufi dancing and attain a state of mystic bliss uh, by finding your center and having a, being a vortex, like a gyroscope of, of being, you know, um, I think there are numerous ways that people sort of align themselves with uh, this uh, mystic reality. But I, I happen to think that entheogens and uh, psychedelics are a, a, a powerful way that could more uh, safely be integrated into, um, you know, the, the sort of... Um, initiatory uh, experiences that that people call into their lives and stuff and I think that the uh, uh, the usefulness of the substances may eventually as if humanity can uh, evolve itself and mature itself um, there may be an application you know, in the future for these uh, substances And, and it's that ability to take what works and leave behind. That's what the evolution of culture is. But you don't abandon the past. And all the beautiful music and the buildings and the traditions, we, we, we just see it differently. When the Spanish Inquisition got to the New World and they found these Aztecs, you know, eating mushrooms and having a jolly old time and having these ecstatic experiences and all that, I mean, if if, as if that wasn't bad enough, but then they were calling it the flesh of the gods. Teonanacatl was the Aztec term for the mushrooms, which meant flesh of the gods. And this just enraged the clerics, and they just, you know, this was like so blasphemous, it couldn't be tolerated. And so they really, you know, reacted 
fair more brutally than they might have other rea otherwise reacted to try to suppress this thing because you know we just couldn't they just couldn't have this kind of thing the parallels were too striking and their Eucharist didn't do much and the Aztec uh, Eucharist uh, you know delivered big time so that was another reason why it had to be suppressed with with the communion where you take the wine and the bread it works for people because it's done in a ritual context. People do have profound experiences, but I think very often, certainly over time, you know, it's a bit of a letdown, really. Mm. Uh, what is probably uh, the case originally is that the wine would have been suffused with something. And also that the bread itself, there's a, a um, psychedelic um, fungi. Well, that's where Which, LSD is, is synthesized, from ergot of rye. Yeah. And they believe that at certain points when, when, the, when the bread was infected, and the medieval um, St. Vitus dance, for example, yeah. if, the, if, the, if the, the fungus has attacked the crop before it's turned into bread, the bread itself becomes psychedelic. Becomes psychedelic. And there were many eruptions in the Middle Ages, in particularly damp summers, when the ergot would flourish, when people would, 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 would go kind of crazy. If Jesus, say, were a, a shaman or a <clears throat> hierophant, which in the Greek term is what he was, a revealer of the mysteries, and he had a mystery, he said, I have a mystery, and he reveals his mystery to whom he ch chooses. Well, so he acted like a shaman and perhaps even a higher stage higher than, than a shaman because shamans not, aren't necessarily spiritual, in my understanding and often aren't. But uh, Jesus' Jesus's mission was intensely spiritual and he wanted to take people to heaven because he said, where I go, you will go also. The things I do, you will do also and greater things even than I do. So the fact that you could take this mushroom, this flesh and blood-like mushroom, and ascend to a heaven of light and love and bliss uh, makes a very, a very literal uh, connection for me to Christianity and to the secret message that I think Jesus was handing out, not to the mass, not to the masses, but to the inner circle. And this is the problem with the ancient pagan mysteries in general. They were mysteries. Everybody who participated was sworn to secrecy. And what's incredible, look, the mysteries of Eleusis were celebrated for a thousand years in the Greek world. Many people, Roman emperors, Cicero, Seneca, we get, uh, all the greats, were initiates. None of them broke their oath and told us what happened. But we know that initiates drank a drink before they began on the sacred way to Eleusis, which was a painful purgatorial process. They were beaten by people with rods. Uh, it was m meant to be a, a visceral, physical experience. And I feel that it was, it was certainly heightened by fasting. So whatever, if they did take anything then, we know that that would have been intensified because it always is when you, when you, when you fast beforehand. Uh, archaeologists have found opium pipes at Eleusis, so we've got enough hints to know. And they, the ancients were master pharmacopoeists. They, they, they knew all of the intoxicating. And it, as Tim says, it came out of the shamanic tradition. In the heart of the Greek mysteries, you know, the cradle of Western civilization, there was the uh, Eleusinian mystery cult, you know, and uh, you had the uh, enactment of. Uh, I guess Demeter and Persephone and, and uh, all this going into the underworld. And then uh, at the height of this maybe six day ceremony or something, they uh, took a psychedelic, which they called this kaikion. There is an illustration. It's used on Robert Graves' Greek myths, uh, uh, which is one maenad who were the female followers of Dionysus holding up a mushroom. Yeah. So there are numerous hints you know, that this was going on. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's... I'd go further, I'd say, I'd, I, really, I'd be surprised if it wasn't true. Yeah. What we can't say, and the reason that um, Peter and I haven't pushed it in our, our research, is because if you're coming out and saying, Jesus doesn't exist, it's such a confronting thing for most people, 
that we've tried to keep to everything we can absolutely meticulously back up. Mm. But here is another possibility which others have looked into much more deeply than we have, and yet really, you know, it would be such a surprise to see such a... Uh, a powerfully transformative process going on that didn't draw on this in some way because they didn't have the same taboos which we've we've now got around changing consciousness. Yeah. And now, now you can look at like um, Socrates' whole allegory of the cave and things like that, and you can you know where people were just look being in their cave and noticing the shadows and thinking that was the world. And then somebody turned around and they went outside and they saw the sun and, you know, it's like, oh my God, he came back and uh, wanted to tell his, all of his uh, friends about it and they absolutely wouldn't look toward the light, you know, no matter what he, he did, you know, they just wanted to stay entranced in their shadow world. We are in this cave, we are watching shadows on the wall and mistaking them for reality, whilst the true source of light is from the mouth of the cave. And Plato even says, what would happen if a wise person came from the sunlight into the cave and said to people, look, you're just looking at shadows, this is not the real world. And then he says they would probably kill him. So they say basically that's what happens with the mystic, you know, and uh, they've, they've seen the light in a sense, and uh, they're trying to tell their brothers and sisters, you know, about the reality of their own um, sort of higher dimensions. The way to understand religion is you've gone from a powerfully transformative event where you would take these psychoactives in a ritual <coughs> context, uh, probably alongside some sort of ritual death, mm -hmm. and your state of consciousness utterly transformed, yeah. to uh, a little little bit of white wafer and some uh, tiny sip of wine in a, in, a, in a context where you're going to go back and sing. Well, I think it hymns. must always be the function of organised religion to neuter, to emasculate the mystical experience. Because what you don't want is people having their own access to the divine. So if people are taking a divine and then having their own personal act, they don't need you. Mm. What, what the whole the point of organised religion is to mediate the divine. They are the intermediaries between you and God. That's the way organized religion works. So it must always, and I think it happened in Hinduism with Soma. We were looking at the fly agaric uh, mushroom, uh, at which uh, Gordon Wasson believed was the uh, uh, Soma. Uh, but uh, at any rate, whatever Soma is, and I don't believe it's the uh, um, the muscimol, I really don't. Uh, I believe it's more like psilocybin, or Steve Hager has even said it's cannabis. You know, if, if you read about it, it's like obviously cannabis. So at any rate, it was some kind of psychedelic, and uh, it was a a way for um, them to uh, basically make a contact with the divine. The ninth mandala of the Rig Veda is entirely devoted to singing the praises of Soma, and yet we do not know what Soma is or was. Our Gordon Wasson spent a considerable portion of his life researching this problem and reached the conclusion that Soma was Amanita muscaria, a mushroom that is symbiotic to pine and birch trees uh, throughout much of the north temperate zone. However, uh, scholars have cast doubt on his identification of Soma. It's, it's quite possible that there were several different um, psychoactive plants used in um, sacramental forms in ancient India. In the most um, developed forms of, um, of Vajrayana Buddhism, the Amrita that was used was called Panchamrita, which means the fivefold Amrita. Uh, so there were five separate plants, I think. I, in, in the literature, in the, in the scriptures, we're told of five different meats 
um, horse, cow, dog, uh, elephant, and man, the great meat. Um, but I believe that these were different plants and that when you, you, you had the fivefold um, elixir uh, to drink and you also ate in uh, ritual context, ate a bite of the, each of the five meats, I think that was really uh, drinking a concoction of five different plants and eat, eating a little of the, the raw plant. Um, and I believe that they were all different psychoactives. Some sort of plant substance was prepared and ingested by a priesthood who then used the ecstatic experience induced by that plant as the basis for all of their metaphysical and philosophical speculations on the nature of the universe. If you read the Rig Veda, all the Vedic hymns, oh, out of a thousand, I think 990 are hymns to Soma. It is the, the blood of the gods, it's the vision of eternity, it's the white gleaming swan of eternity. It's like, But now in Hindu culture, Soma is just a milky drink. And I think the same process has gone on. People have realized if you want to actually control people, you have to shut down their access. And it's certainly what happened with Gnosticism. Gnosticism said, no, God is in you, like Paul said, Christ is in you. That's fatal for organised religion because then everybody can have their own personal relationship with Christ. Why do I need to go to church to experience Christ? I can do it on my own. The psychedelic experience is as central to understanding your humanness as having sex, or having a child, or having responsibilities, or, or having hopes and dreams, and yet it is illegal. We are somehow told we are infantilized. We're told, you know, you can wander around within the sanctioned playpen of ordinary consciousness, and we have some intoxicants over here. If you want to mess yourself up, we've got some scotch here and some tobacco and red meat and some sugar and a little TV. But these boundary dissolving uh, hallucinogens that give you a sense of unity with your fellow man and nature are somehow forbidden. This is an outrage. It's a sign of cultural immaturity. And the fact that we tolerate it is a sign that we are uh, living in a society as oppressed as any society in the past.
Thank you.